Hi everyone and welcome to Miriam Pianos on YouTube. Today we are going to be comparing the Roland GP607 with Kawai's new DG30. Both are small baby grand digital pianos in the marketplace. Both are very well made, very popular and lots to offer for the price point. So we're going to be talking about their sound, uh, you know, the speaker systems, how those compare, the tone generator, how those compare, uh, the action giving you a chance to hear some of the acoustic uh, piano tones side by side uh, and discussing some of the other features. If it is the first time to the channel, uh, we would really appreciate if you hit that subscribe, if you find the video useful, and we would love to get your comments as well. We try and participate and respond to as many of those as we possibly can. So without further ado, let's get started with Roland's GP607 and Kawai's DG30 right away. When we're comparing the Roland GP607 with the Kawai DG30, in a lot of ways this is the battle of sampling versus modeling. Um, with the 607, we have Roland's, really it's their V piano engine, uh, and it is producing a fully digitally originated sound. It's a computer model that's generating that piano tone right from scratch. And this is something that they have in several of the models. It's not unique to the 607. Um, it happens in really most of the models from about the DP603 and up uh, in their lineup. And it's a technology that Roland uh, was one of really the, the early innovators of in the industry. Um, they had it uh, coming out about the same time as some of even the software DAW providers that use the same um, kind of basic premise to generate it, such as Piano Tech. And that is that you're using uh, kind of mathematics uh, algorithm, really, uh, to recreate um, the, how a piano tone actually comes to be. And then gives you all the parameters to adjust that. Uh, so you have the ability to adjust uh, damper resonance and string re resonance and cabinet resonance and how tall the lid op is open and the voicing of the hammer and, and all kinds of stuff. Uh, and the result over the last few years from Roland has been a very convincing uh, piano tone. So this is their default concert piano which on the GP607 is delivered in limitless polyphony. That means that it's able to really generate, um, practically speaking, an unlimited simultaneous number of notes. It's a thick tone, it's a rich tone, there's lots of partials happening in that tone. Uh, and the Roland sound system is able to deliver that even without uh, you know, headphones to really hear all that precise detail. The speaker system that they equip this with uh, is sufficient that you are getting a lot of that uh, richness, a lot of that fullness uh, coming at you. Um, Now you can manipulate that piano tone with Piano Designer. This is a function that is available both on board as well as through a Piano Designer app, which you can get 
uh, I believe for both iOS and Android from Roland, free of charge. And it's like a companion app that works with this. So if we go into Piano Designer, you start to see all of these parameters that I was just talking about that you have the ability to edit. So um, how tall the lid is up and down. And so you can hear that this is at four right now. And if I start to close it, You can really hear that you lose um, both ambience. You some, you know, there's uh, some top end off the inst uh, off the uh, the frequency range that starts to get cut, cut off. Um, key off noise is there as well. Uh, hammer noise, duplex scale. Uh, you know how rich and how thick the upper treble uh, gets on attack. Full string scale resonance, damper resonance, key off resonance, soundboard type, damper noise, like all kinds of stuff. Uh, so that is accessible through uh, the Piano Designer app. Um, and when we're talking about a comparison with the DG30, uh, really that's one of the most meaningful points of comparison between these two instruments is the tone generator. Um, now, you're not going to like or dislike a piano based on the type of tone generator. You're obviously going to respond more to the actual experience of hearing that sound and interacting with that sound. But I always find that it's interesting to know where that sound actually uh, originates from. So in this case, we've got this V piano. I'm calling it V piano. I think Roland just simply calls it uh, like a full modeling uh, piano engine. Once you get outside of the piano tones, you're now into uh, over 300 piano tones that are available, not piano tones, 300 tones overall that are available through the 607. And with those, you have 384 max polyphony, uh, really more than you would ever possibly need. So, I mean, in effect, uh, even the rest of it is limitless polyphony in a way, but there is a, a, a specific limit of 384 rather than a theoretical non-limit uh, with the other stuff. Uh, the speaker system on the GP607 definitely is beefier uh, on paper than the uh, DG30. We have a subwoofer on the bottom that's powered by a single 20 watt amplifier. Then we've got two mains um, that are in the kind of the soundboard area that's also powered by a stereo 20 watt amplifier. And then we've got two tweeters, which sort of, I mean, it, it's kind of outputting higher end frequencies in this general area. They're not that directional, um, but, they're, but they're there, and it's being driven by a five watt stereo amplifier. So we've got five distinct uh, points of sound source with the Roland, uh, but the other thing that they've done is the way in which this uh, artificial soundboard, and I'm not sure whether the R Roland refers to this as a soundboard, but it's definitely a passive resonating surface kind of has that box effect where uh, this is uh, allowed to vibrate and is, is kind of uh, stimulated by both the sub as well as the two mains. And it actually does contribute to the overall acoustic um, uh, kind of effect of playing the instrument. particularly down in the low end. Uh, people who have watched a number of these Roland reviews on the channel before will have heard us go through extensively the type of other sounds that are available. So I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time doing that right now because really this is a comparison between the two instruments and largely focused on the pianistic uh, char characteristic comparison between the two instruments. But I will give you a quick sample. 
So both instruments have a great selection of electric pianos, digital piano sounds, um, and acoustic pianos, uh, but uh, the sheer quantity of sound selection on the Roland is definitely more than the Kawaii. So if we get back to, uh, oh shoot, um, here's another few examples of some different acoustic pianos on here as well. So this is a ballad piano. Then we've got mellow piano. And bright piano. That's bright. And that's all there is, at least uh, on this interface, uh, for accessing those um, I guess piano models that are working off of the modeling engine, the modeling software. Uh, to really get the maximum out of this instrument, you do want to use the Piano uh, Partner 2 app. That's another free app from Roland that works with this both wirelessly and wired. It's up to you. It's entirely your choice. Uh, but that's a, a quick summary and a, a good sample of you being able to hear what this instrument produces before we move uh, you know, onto the sound of the DG30. Um, we're also going to talk about the action of both instruments as well as some of the other non-features. Uh, but just to summarize the sound before we move on, uh, we've got this, again, computer model driving the piano tone. We've got a really nicely balanced set of speakers and amplifiers that I think is just a perfect match for the tone engine driving it and uh, also appropriately powered for the size of the instrument where you might find this instrument. Uh, it's definitely not lacking and it really puts out a, a warm, uh, deep uh, bass presence as well as an, is a nice, clear, but never piercing treble, uh, which is also not the easiest thing uh, to nail when you've got exposed speakers like this. So anyway, we'll throw a few specs up on uh, the screen for both once we've uh, looked at each, uh, but thank you so much for being with us. We are gonna take a look now at the sound from the DG30. So like I was just mentioning over on the GP607, between these two instruments, it's really a battle between sampling and a battle, or between sampling and modeling rather. Uh, the DG30 comes with a beautifully rich SKEX nine foot concert grand full sample set. And it's a multi-layer, multi-dimensional individual note sample set. That's pretty much as good as it gets when it comes to samples uh, from the digital piano world in an instrument. You can go crazier than that when you get into some of the DAW software. You can get into like eight layer uh, samples, individual notes, but uh, really nobody's equipping uh, physical instruments uh, out of the box with stuff like this. So when it comes to sample based playback, this is pretty much the best that it gets. Just like for modeling based playback on the Roland, that's basically as good as it's going to get uh, when it comes to a digital piano as well. And so the difference between the two uh, really comes down to personal preference and personal taste. You may not even be able to tell which one is which, but you may have a, a preference between the two for reasons you may not even be able to articulate.
there are quite a few differences when it comes to the speaker system uh, uh, between the two instruments. And when we get to here uh, with the DG30, we've got 40 watts of power versus um, over there, which is about, I think, 45 watts of power in total. So fairly close, but the, the way that it's configured is quite a bit different. So there's no single subwoofer on the DG30. We've got two larger main speakers on the bottom that are both in stereo, uh, kind of facing down and projecting a lot of those lower frequencies into the floor. Uh, and then on the top, we've got not quite tweeters, the sort of smaller mid-range speakers uh, that are projecting a lot of those upper harmonics and upper frequencies um, up into the lid uh, and obviously just around in an ambient sense around the instrument. So we've got four speakers versus five speakers uh, and it really comes down to how well they're balanced. Now, I would say out of the box, the DG30 does need a tweak to uh, the SK Concert Grand through the virtual technician before I'm getting enough mid-range and upper, uh, when I say mid-range, I'm talking mid-frequency and upper frequency definition. And so with just a little bit of tweaking, and I really like uh, the full setting uh, within the smart mode on the virtual technician, this instrument really comes alive and feels beautifully balanced to me. It's got a nice, nice rich um, up, you know, upper harmonic, nice rich lower harmonic. Nothing feels uh, too boomy or too, you know, too empty or, or not clear enough. It's really great. So something to keep in mind that if you are in a showroom and you are trying out a GG30, especially if you're doing it in a side-by-side -side sense with something else, I would play around with the settings before making any conclusions uh, because it doesn't take much, but I do find that the default setting for the SK Grand, the way they've got these amps um, uh, you know, set up and balanced and the speakers uh, set up and balanced, it's just not quite clear enough to my ear. But like I said, this is hardly something that's difficult to fix. It's actually quite easy to resolve with just a small amount of tweaking. In terms of polyphony, we've got 256 versus the uh, limitless polyphony over in the Roland. So uh, in terms of just sheer spec, I suppose the Roland beats out the Kawai. In terms of practical um, usage, 256 is more than enough for solo piano playing in really any context. Uh, so I don't think either one really presents any limitations. Um, but I mean, it's worth noting that there is that difference uh, in the polyphony or the stated polyphony. Last thing I'll say about tone uh, on this particular instrument is that I've really enjoyed starting to play around with virtual technician smart mode settings. Uh, in fact, I think a lot of the uh, piano one and piano two categories here are really just different savings of, uh, of the virtual technician based on the same sample set, I think. Could very well be that. Um, the SKEX isn't the only sample set that's contained within here. You've also got the EX Concert Grand as well as the SK5 Concert Grand. So these three um, are, are kind of distinct samples that you can access. But of course, the primary one is the SK Concert Grand. And when you're playing around with those virtual technician presets, uh, I believe it's the SK Concert Grand that you're actually manipulating. So. Uh, that's what we're getting out of the DG30, an instrument that's also capable of producing a very similar level of sound versus the GP607, um, but you've got that sample base, which I think actually provides some of that subtle imperfection that some people really like to hear when they're listening to an acoustic piano that kind of makes it sound 
more uh, natural. Uh, you know, some people say that the, the roll and sound can sometimes be a little bit clinical, uh, but on the other hand, you have so much, um, you know, malleable parts to the roll and tone um, that you can pretty much make it however you want. Then you've got other people who just think the, the Roland sounds more like uh, kind of almost a Steinway sound versus the Kawhi, which obviously is modeling off a of Kawhi. So it's all very, very, very personal. Um, and then we've got the four speakers versus the five speakers. Uh, and uh, yeah. So final comparison on sound between these two. Well, I think the Roland uh, kind of takes the cake when it comes to out of the box readiness, as well as just the sheer quantity of tone. However, uh, like I said, with a little bit of tweaking, I've been able to get the Kawhi to just as satisfying a level as the Roland, like a minute or two, no problem. And let's remember that in most markets, this instrument's about $1,000 less than the Roland. So you really have to be able to put a price on all of those extra tones that you're getting with the Roland versus the Kawhi. And if that's not that big a deal, then you really could be looking at two very, very equally valued but slightly different sounding instruments to select from. So let's move on to the action with the uh, Roland, and then we'll be back uh, for a comparison of the action on the Kawhi. So the action on this one is called the PHA-50. This is an action that uh, Roland puts in many of their models and it's an upgrade to, I, I guess it's a little closer to like their, I think it was the Grand, uh, Grand Feel action that first debuted I think in the G8 Phantom. But uh, I'm sure somebody can correct me on that if that's incorrect. Uh, but it's a wood core key. So I suppose by some definitions you could call this a hybrid action. Um, it does, uh, the key does uh, have its pivot point just behind uh, where you could, you know, just stop seeing it. So there's not exactly a full uh, key stick length in there, um, but it is a little bit longer than most. Um, and it's, it doesn't use any springs uh, whatsoever to produce any of, of that friction, like a lot of modern actions. It's just using counterweights and gravity. Uh, and one thing that I can say about this action is because I have quite a bit of onstage experience with it, because uh, it's also the one that's in the RD2000, insanely, insanely durable. Thousands of hours at this point on that instrument and really not a single failure um, or any uneven MIDI output on that instrument uh, either. The PHA-50 comes with a triple sensor, which uh, works really well if you're going to be using any of Roland's products for MIDI inputting. Uh, and for people who are advanced classical players, at one point in my life I might have considered myself that, but those chops are a little rusty these days. Um, but for people who are really going to be going at some serious classical playing on an instrument like this, the triple sensor can also help with uh, really quick repetition speed and making sure that those notes are always struck quite accurately. This action also has a light ivory texture. So uh, rather than just being uh, kind of a homogenous texture that you find on the Kawai, this one actually has like a faux ivory look to it, as well as the black keys have like a faux ebony look to it. So the texture is great. Your, your fingers glide across the keys really well. I would say if there was one uh, complaint I have of this action and something I found and just sort of learned to deal with on the RD2000 uh, is that the edges of the white keys aren't quite as rounded as I would prefer. This is a highly personal thing, so I don't really see this as a critique so much of the action as just expressing that I personally would love to see those edges rounded a little bit more. Um, but besides that, it's an action that I've really enjoyed playing on it's a little less Roland-like than any of their other actions up to this point. The PHA-4, uh, which is the other action that's really in wide use within the Roland line right now, feels more like a Roland, meaning it's got a, a, you know, a, a firmer bottom uh, to the keystroke. Uh, you can really, uh, it's, it's uh, got a bit more of a, a, a firmer clunk. I don't wanna say clunk, because you don't hear the clunk, but you definitely feel the clunk when you're playing on a PHA-4, and there's a lot of people who really like that. It feels like you've got a nice firm key bed. This has got a, a little more spongy by design, uh, something that is supposed to, I guess, mimic that of an acoustic piano a little bit more. So that's a, a quick review of the PHA-50. We're going to uh, now 
of course, flip over to the DG30 and we're gonna talk about action. So the DG30 uses Kawhi's RH3 action and this is almost kind of like a second generation RH3 action. They didn't really officially call it an upgrade, but I happen to know that there were some tweaks to the RH3 just within the last year, both in terms of its sensor strip. Uh, and it also feels like it's just anchored a little bit differently, uh, you know, in the key uh, mechanism. It just feels uh, a little more solid. There's less lateral motion uh, than what I was getting before. So uh, my impression is that they have taken some of the engineering lessons from the first generation RH3 and made this an even more durable action and a slightly more sensitive action. Um, it, like the PHA50, has escapement. I don't think I mentioned that on the PHA50. So for people who, uh, where that's a factor, you know, be aware that they both are bringing that to you. Um, this has not so much a, f a faux ivory texture, but it definitely has a micro texture on top to create that nice blend of grip and slipperiness. And it's pretty much the same texture on both the black keys and the white keys. In terms of the action that I enjoy the most, Oh man, that's, that's a tricky one. I think it comes down to uh, really a lot of stylistic parts. Yeah, I would have to play these for hours and hours to, to really uh, come up with a very, very clear preference. But my um, very first impressions are that I think I'm more likely to enjoy playing classical probably on the, on the Kawhi. It feels like the repetition speed is a little bit quicker. Um, and, but the Roland feels so familiar because I'm so used to it. Uh, and, it and the Roland is, is just a, a, an extremely comfortable, extremely intuitive action uh, to play on. So I don't think either one of them uh, presents an unenjoyable experience. You, with action, you just have to try. It's a very personal thing. But like I said, if I was going to be tackling or practicing some classical, I think I would probably default to the Kawhi because I think it responds a little bit more um, like, you know, like a, like a, a shorter grand, actual acoustic grand. Um, but I really love how the Roland feels as well. And I think I would feel a lot more comfortable playing uh, jazz pop uh, repertoire on the Roland for sure. And could you do classical on the Roland? Yeah, of course it would work really well. Uh, so it just comes down to personal preference, but those are my thoughts. Uh, so let's just uh, head back over to the Roland for a quick roundup on features, and then we will be back to the Kawhi with the same. So when it comes to features between these two instruments, there's a lot of commonality. Both have Bluetooth MIDI, both have Bluetooth audio. So you can use either of these instruments uh, to transmit Bluetooth audio information to and use it as a speaker. You can also wirelessly connect this uh, to pretty much any device that uses MIDI technology in any way, shape, or form and obviously has up-to-date MIDI protocols on that device. Um, this has, uh, I, I think, a completely different user interface than the DG30 and in some ways I like this a little bit more because it's nice and spread out and you have to rely less on uh, the menu. On the other hand, there's parts about the DG30's user interface that I actually appreciate more. Uh, one thing that I, uh, I, it's not, again, not really a complaint, it's just something to be aware of. There's additional functionality with the GP607 that can really only be unlocked when you're using the Piano Partner 2. And one of those would be the extra auto accompaniment rhythms, something that's not available on the DG30, by the way, no matter what features or what, what you know, extra apps you're using. But on this, you can actually get them when you're using the app. And when you're also going to access the huge additional number of sounds that are available on here, 
uh, the app also gets a lot easier in terms of navigating. Uh, so I would highly suggest if you are going to be a Roland user that those apps are almost a must. It makes it in a lot of ways more fun to use, uh, but some of the stuff you just can't get to in any practical sense un unless you are using that app. Both of these instruments also have audio outputs, quarter inch audio outputs, which is great if you're going to feed this into a stereo of any kind. Uh, because, of course, you can't broadcast Bluetooth audio out, inbound only, not outbound. So you cannot use this with Bluetooth headphones or any sort of a Bluetooth receiver on a stereo. Won't work, inbound only. Uh, two headphone ports as well, and you've got the option to record both USB MIDI to like a MIDI key, as well as wired uh, to the computer where you could do that uh, a MIDI stream to the computer and then render the sound in some sort of a DAW over there. They also both have three really accurately weighted um, uh, pedals, uh, which is, is also really convenient when you are playing more advanced classical music and that pedal resistance is something that you get really, really used to and you actually need to have some uh, you know, uniformity between an experience playing on this versus an experience playing on an acoustic. Besides that, it's got all the usual stuff. Uh, most modern digital pianos at this point integrate a lot of different learning systems into it in terms of having preloaded um, pre pieces, uh, options where you can turn the left and the right hand off when you're you know, learning some of those pieces and having an accompaniment play behind you. You can split the keyboard, you can layer the keyboard, you can transpose, there's metronome, there's drum beats, all of those other things. Uh, I mean, it's important to mention, but at this point in 2020, many of those are almost a given when you're talking about spending this kind of money on an instrument. So we're going to finish things off by hopping back over to the DG30 and reviewing its main features. Uh, and we will be back in just a second. Like I said with the Roland, there's quite a few commonalities between the DG30 and the, um, uh, the 607 in terms of features. Uh, two of them right off the bat. They both have Bluetooth MIDI as well as Bluetooth audio. Again, that's just inbound Bluetooth audio, not outbound. You cannot hook this up as a sound source to another MIDI speaker or MIDI headphones or anything like that. Uh, you also have the ability to record directly onto a, a USB key in either Wave MP3 um, or you can have a corded uh, MIDI connection through uh, USB to a computer if you're going to use this as some sort of a recording source. Uh, it also has uh, left and right quarter inch output so you can take a high quality audio signal into a, a recording interface if you really want to use the tone engine that's already built in and inherently in this uh, instrument. Um, and uh, I already mentioned it also on the Roland, but they both have really high quality three pedal systems. I know it seems a little random to mention this as a feature, but I know particularly with Kawhi, they've made a big deal of balancing all of the spring tensions so that the left pedal, the middle pedal, and the right pedal feel like a left, middle, and right pedal on a real grand piano. They don't have identical depths and they don't have identical spring tensions. Uh, and I think Kawhi has identified this as something that it, I, uh, certainly some of their user base was interested in uh, or thought would be interested in. And you kind of, it kind of makes a difference. Uh, it's interesting to feel uh, the left pedal versus the right pedal and notice that difference just like you would on a real grand. It kind of just creates one extra layer of comfort and familiarity. Both instruments use a high quality polyester finish just like you would find on an acoustic piano. Um, both have you know, the same layering, same splitting uh, function um, and a limited onboard recorder as well. So just to wrap up between these two instruments, is there a clear winner? Well, I think, uh, you know, based on the fact that the Kawhi is $1,000 less uh, and that I think the tone generator is of a similar quality and the amplifier system on the two instruments is also of a pretty similar um, uh, power level, I think just on the value of the piano experience alone, the, the Kawhi seems to me to be an incredible value uh, for sure. I think you're getting a lot for your money. I think those Onkyo speakers in there, which I didn't mention before, but you've got uh, Onkyo amps, Onkyo speakers, Onkyo soundboard uh, in there. Uh, that's going to produce a lot of really good, clean uh, tone 
out of this instrument. Now, are there other things on the Roland you're getting for that extra money? Yeah, you're getting auto accompaniment if you use it through the Piano Partner 2 app. You're getting far more uh, extra tones um, for your usage. And I think uh, you're getting a little bit extra wattage, but you're, you're getting a fifth speaker. So to your ear, in a, and in a specific acoustic, in a specific room, I could see that fifth speaker uh, being a big deal. That may make the difference to you, and it may be worth the extra money. Um, but one thing is clear, that if you're looking to spend money on a digital grand piano, and your budget is sort of in the five to $10,000 range, you are gonna wanna check both of these out. Uh, it's hard to identify a weak point in either one of these models. I think they compare really well to one another. And ultimately, I think it's going to come down to a personal preference of touch and the piano tone. I think the price is close enough that anyone who's not in love with the piano tone shouldn't spend extra or save extra um, uh, for, for you know, pricing's sake. Uh, they're close enough that I think you should just sit down and choose the touch you love and the sound you love and the quality from both of these companies is going to just deliver a sensational experience. So, Thank you so much for checking out this uh, comparison and, and kind of a, a, a deeper look into both the GP607 and DG30. We really appreciate that you've stopped by the channel. Uh, we hope that you found the video helpful and there's tons more on the channel for you to look at uh, and investigate if you are in the market for a piano. So uh, if you haven't yet subscribed, we would encourage you to do so. Hit that notification bell and hopefully we will see you back for more videos. Thanks so much. Sun is